Hi everybody, welcome to another GMG Review. Today we're taking a look at the latest offering from Games Workshop. It is Warhammer Age of Sigmar Warcry. Um, this enormous box is their latest skirmish game, a uh, kitchen table size game in the same vein as Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team. Um, but I will, I will tell you right now, this is not Kill Team from a rule standpoint. <laughs> uh, so, um, full disclosure, I haven't actually played this game yet. Originally, this video was going to be airing on Saturday, and I was going to have a, had a chance to um, actually go through and play the gameplay. I have read through the entire rulebook and looked at all stack cards and stuff, and I do have some opinions, so I will be able to give like an, an actual review of the contents of the box, the frames, the model kits, um, and then more of that will come after I've actually played the game. So uh, mechanically, I understand how the game works. Um, I've read through all the rules in the background, everything that's in this box. I don't know anything about, obviously, the expansion warbands that aren't in this box or any of the Age of Sigmar faction warbands, which also exist in the game. There are a number of warbands that basically are going to get cards right at the gate um, to use in this game as well. So uh, the, the, the plan is that you will get to see the Let's Play gameplay video on Saturday. That is still happening. Uh, Owen and I are going to be painting up the contents of the box over the next 24 hours, basically, <laughs> trying it out. This showed up at 4.55 on a Thursday, um, and the videos go up at 6 a.m. on Saturday, so this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a quick turnaround. But um, yeah, anyway, you guys get, the, you get to do my, see my GMG review now. I hope that'll hold you over until you get a gameplay video. But um, we got to go ahead for unboxing and um, how to play videos, which is what this is, and then you'll see a full gameplay video on Saturday when I'm allowed to do that. So let's, uh, crack open the box. First thing I notice, the box is freaking enormous. It's, it's actually showing up on the green screen with me because it's so tall. It's like six inches tall. Oh God. It's, yeah, it's a huge, enormous wide box and it is just absolutely brimming with stuff. You get two warbands, you get the iron golems and the savage beasts and you get a whole bunch of monsters. So it looks like there's about 10-ish models per frame. I was counting legs here, although some of them are split up, which is a bit hard to do. But it looks like there's about 10 guys. Um, you get a big critter big monster for the savage beasts uh and it looks like if this was going to fold up this would go into like a necromunda gang size box for actually buying them uh and there is a, the announcement did say there's going to be plans for aos rules for all these two so there will be like rules for using this as like a unit um in like a probably i'm gonna guess slaves to darkness like whatever the war queen we have war queen and the dark oath shaman go into i really hope that dark oath shaman comes out for uh, whatever the commander's expansion for this game is because he's an awesome miniature and I, I don't have a copy of Silver Tower because we played with Danny's copy of Silver Tower um, and I really want one. I'll do it. I do have a War Queen. Uh, so you get these guys. They don't have a lot of customizability, it looks like. I, I might be missing it. There might be like some little knives and stuff you can glue on people here, but it looks like most of the arms, the way the cuts are being done, um, is fairly prescriptive in the way that you build them. So I imagine that the variations are through their stack cards, not through how you can equip them. So slightly less granular than Kill Team in that regard, but more in keeping with the general like army building rules right now in AOS where it is less granular and you don't equip models model by model for like a point value or anything like that. You just kind of give them what they have. Uh, and then you got your Iron Golems. Now it's funny, they come with a critter. The Iron Golems I wanted to paint since I first saw them because they come with a Chaos Dwarf and an Ogre, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, so where the Savage Beasts are like Taming the Beasts of Chaos and live in the realm of Gur, these guys live in the realm of uh, Metal, which is Kamon, um, or they're from the realm of Metal, and they're trying to become Archeon's armorers. Yeah, there's your Chaos Dwarf and your Ogre over there, and that's why I wanted to paint them. They, they look like big daddies from Rapture, which is pretty rad. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint these guys up. Owen's going to paint up the Savage Beasts. Um, both of these look like good candidates for contrast paint, although I'm going to probably use some um, of those great color shift paints uh, that I have um, from Green Stuff World because they look like they're going to be really great too. Uh, and then you get some monsters. And the reason you get some monsters is the twist table. So the twist cards that you, you like put down will often have unaligned monsters, chaotic monsters that show up. And both players can attempt to activate them. But there's a chance that when you attempt to activate one, your opponent gets to do it instead. So you get your, uh, your Dilophosauruses, I'm going to call them. I don't know what the Chaos Warhammer names for these are. But they look like the spitty monster from Jurassic Park that kills Newman from Seinfeld. There you go. There's a, there's a layered reference for you. I hope you enjoyed that. And then you get some hoppies, some harpy mans, um, who are like, uh, uh, they're harpies. <laughs> like they just look like chaos harpies from way back in the day. Uh, and it looks like you get four and four ish. Maybe. F yeah. Four and four, I think. So you get like eight monsters total. It's pretty cool. And then a massive, massive, massive pile of scenery, like just so much scenery. Now, what's interesting is the scenery rules, and I will kind of spoil this while I get through the rule, the, the, the sort of stuff in the box first. 
They are a bit prescriptive. The, there's actually cards you flip that give you a standardized scenery layout. So it's kind of like playing in a competitive kill team event where they do a prescribed scenery layout or kill team arena where they do the same thing. Um, they are super cool though. It looks mostly like overgrown Azerite ruins with like chaos -y, like bits and stuff on them. There's lots of gantries. Uh, if you did want to use this for Mordheim and stuff, it would be perfect. Because it does have like busted down gates and old wells, all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, these appear to be the same frame. So they've each got a floor, but that like walkways and barricades one is, is I think a singular frame. Uh, and then this one right here, the big, the big giant head, the incoming message from the big giant head. It's, uh, it's also a, uh, a singular frame. It's also got your ladder and stuff in it too. And then the giant Sigmar's head, because everybody loves a giant Sigmar head. Uh, it is pretty chunky, so it looks like it's going to be fairly quick to assemble. Yeah, here's some more. I think this is actually the, no, not quite the same frame. There's two of this one though. And there's your big bell tower and more ladders and stuff too, which is cool. And gibbets. I think this is actually the same gibbet off of one of the other scenery frames, but there are like a pile of skeleton gibbets in here. And I would imagine that first the saving of time. Yes, yeah, so there's three unique frames and two double frames in here. Looks like the buildings themselves come on double frames and there's like three unique accessory frames for like some of the more esoteric bits of scenery. Uh, I imagine some of that stuff is probably going to get glued on later on. I'm going to build the big chunks and leave the little chunks on and paint them separately. Uh, and then you get your what's in the box, your, your, your assembly instructions for your warbands. Did I guess right? It looks like there's three, six, seven, eight. Actually, there's only eight iron golems and two, four, six, eight, and a beast. You actually get more miniatures in the um, Savage Beast one. All that kind of makes sense considering how armored up all the uh, the guys are. And well, you got way more than I thought you got. You got one, two, three, four, five, six uh, Dilophosaurus flappy guys, and one, two, three, four, five, six of the other guys too. Okay, so it's actually less than I thought it was for the, the, the two warbands, uh, nine and eight, but then you get uh, like a whole pile of Chaotic Beasts, and then you get all your scenery stuff instructions too, which is neat. Uh, and it's all in full color with shout outs and cutouts and stuff, which is super handy. Uh, yeah, so your what's in the box, which is, of course, not Gwyneth Paltrow's head. There's another movie reference for you. Uh, and uh, getting started with Warcry thing, which I could just read that and we could be done the review, but that's not what you guys want to see. And then you get your handy dandy, uh, we're protecting all the other components from the sprues thing, which doubles as a poster, a pretty super sweet poster. Uh, you get the same poster as a come check out the anthology of Warcry stories novel. And you get your board. And he's already opened this because this is already opened up. Which is nice, it's the exact same size as the kill team board. Um, and it's got a deserty side and a gloomy side, a gloomy chaosy side. It is that same nice matte finish, which is really cool. I'm happy that that's um, kind of the way they've gone with this. You get your rule book, which is 158 pages. You get your tokens, there's actually far less tokens than I thought there would be. Uh, there's a pile of wound tokens, but they're all numbered. You get some activation tokens, some objective tokens, which are these guys right here. Uh, and then a few other like boss tokens and stuff, which are neat, but far less tokens than I thought, because you, well, I'll explain it when we get to the rules, but there's less like status tracking involved in this. Uh, the only token that you really need to track status with are these ones, which are the weight tokens, when you take a weight action. You get your dice, uh, you're gonna get, so you're very specifically gonna get six colored dice, and then some like play in the game dice. So I don't think either of these have, no, there's no like, there's no faction symbols on them. They're just this like sword skull, like critical hit symbol. Um, and uh, and you're gonna need some for your wild dice and some for your initiative dice. Then you're gonna get your uh, cards for your twists, your victory condition cards, uh, your deployment cards and your battlefield cards. Now handily enough, except for I think the battlefield cards, all of this information, these are literal game aids. These are, these are player aids that will assist you in playing the game, but aren't necessarily required because it is reprinted in the rule books. If you don't have those, you're gonna be okay because, let me just see if I can find them. Here you go, yeah, so your victory card table is in here, your deployment card table is in here at the back. So like, if you just bought the rule book separately, you would have the information to play the game. That was a concern of mine as soon as I saw that how many accessories there were, was that you might not be able to actually play the game without the cards, uh, which would have been kind of, kind of awful. But your battle plan stuff is in here, so your train cards, your deployment, your victory, and your twist are all in here. So you don't have to have those cards. If they go walkabout for some reason, you'd be okay. Uh, there's also two other quick references. 
which are your uh, Warband Abilities cards. Every Warband has a list of like power moves basically they can do by spending rolls off of the initiative um, roll, and then your universal ones that anybody can do, and they reprint the beast ones on the back too, which is handy. So these are good, that first stack of four boxes and four cards is good accessories. The kind of accessories you want. Now let's talk about the other accessories. <laughs> which is your character cards. Now, Kill Team did have something like this. They had fillable character cards, and the fillable character cards were um, meant for tracking the information for all of your Warband members, right? Uh, these are not fillable information cards, and that's okay because you don't actually ever change the stats of your guys. Um, they, don't, they, don't get, they don't get stat changes, um, but you don't get this information in the rulebook. So, if you want to know what the stats for any of these miniatures are when you've built them, you are not going to find them in the pages of the rulebook, unfortunately. Uh, and that, that presents a problem for me because very often times when games, especially as games get older, people only find the rulebooks. And all of a sudden, if stuff becomes hard to find, if you can't find these cards, I mean, yes, it'll be on the internet. It'll get, it'll get stored and, and passed around somehow. But... They, there's no, there's only going to be a digital history. There'll never be a print history of it in the rules. Like in the kill team rulebook, all of the rules for all the kill teams were printed in the actual like rulebook itself. In this game, the information for playing with the miniatures is only on these cards. So if you were thinking, oh, I'll just grab the rulebook and the warband I like, no, you're only going to get the cards for the savage beasts. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven cards for the Savage Beast. I guess you get some doubles for like unit types. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for the golems. What the hell? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Apparently there's a lot more unit types for the golems. Let me just count these again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, I wasn't wrong. Including the kitty, there's seven for the Savage Beasts. And then you get your Chaotic Monsters ones, too. Um, the info for playing with these is only going to be on these cards. So... Don't lose your cards. Uh, if you're thinking about getting a faction, make sure you pre-order the cards because it's they, there ain't nothing else in here. <laughs> you're, not, you're not finding the information for playing with the models in the rulebook itself. This is just the core rules for the game, all the campaign rules, and how to set up a battle and stuff like that. Uh, so let's talk about that. I mean, that's the only other thing that's in that box right now that I just moved out of the way is bases. So you don't need to worry about that too much. I think we're, we're, we're okay to get on with the core book. So this is the core book. This is apparently gonna be available separately too um, for pre-order. And I'm going to offend everybody by doing this. Oh, God, look, it's already broken. <laughs> it's already come unglued. Great. Uh, but yeah, so the first 22 pages are given over to um, your background for the, the different warbands and stuff. So there's a good amount of fluff in this. And then why everybody's going to seek power, what kind of quests they're doing, and how they're trying to like figure out what's going on. Um, then you've got your uh, playing war cry. So the core rules are the next 32 through... 50, so 18 pages of rules. There's not, it's not that rules intensive. And then rules for open play narrative play match play, because this does follow that GW model of we're gonna have three ways to play and they're all gonna be in the same core rule book. Uh, then you have your campaign section. And what's very encouraging is the campaign section actually does dominate the vast majority of this book. Pages 80 through 128 um, are actually gonna be in there uh, as campaign. So you got another 48 out of your 161 pages, like almost a third of the book is going to be campaign rules. Now, the actual rules for playing a campaign and how guys get better are, are actually only pages 62 to 64. So only four, five pages of the game or that part. The campaign section is actually just all the story for the narrative campaigns. And every faction gets, for the, for the actual factions in the game, they get three campaigns to play through. So they get three, and, and the promise of releasing more in the future. So three campaigns, they're basically all nine games each, if I remember correctly, so like 27 games of campaign play. Um, and then all of the not Warcry factions that have been given a Warcry symbol get one. They get one campaign to, to run through. So nine-ish games, I think, to, put, to play through. And one like artifact to chase, one thing to try and find. But the promise is in here that they will make more of this consumable content where you can get more campaigns and play them then you get your background tables and these are so in the kill team book this would have had all your stats this is just your random name generator your like background story for your leader and for potentially like an up-and-comer so it's it's just like your tables to roll on for fluff and stuff like that and more background on each of them and that's it so we're gonna skip past the if you haven't been paying attention on warhammer community 
uh, to the different factions and what they do. They've been doing like a spoiler like every single day for the last little while. So I think if you've been living under a rock, <laughs> the TLDR version is every realm has its own like kind of like sub faction of humans that are worshiping the chaos gods vying for glory. These are them. Uh, the only one not represented by a warband right now in, sh in this game is the Bloodbound. Or sorry, Akshi, the Realm of Fire, but that's because the Bloodbound are basically them. So, so yeah, imagine you're going to get rules for Bloodbound eventually because clearly there's stuff here. <laughs> I think it would be really cool if the Bloodbound got a crossover with Shadespire and the Bloodbound Warband of seven miniatures was actually the, or eight miniatures was actually the, nine miniatures actually, would be the um, two Magor's Fiends and uh, Garrick's Reavers. Just use those miniatures for this. Perfect. Done. And then eventually give all of the warbands in this game shades bar rules. Could I be seeing something coming? Am I looking into the future? I mean, I'm not not looking into the future. <laughs> it happened. It happened with those two easy to build sets that I that I totally called were going to be shades bar warbands at some point. Um, you never know. Who knows? Let's find out. So core rules. Uh, this is going to overview all the stuff you've seen in every Games Workshop Pro Book before. These are the core rules. Here's three ways to play. Here's the campaign section of how you're going to play that. Here's all the tokens. So you got your activation tokens. You got your weight tokens. Those are actually double-sided. So if you flip them, that's what they should look like. An objective marker, number three. So like, ooh, a spooky eye. Uh, damage token, number four. And they're all numbered. So if it's one, it's you've taken one wound. And the thing you will see in this game is you have a spectacular number of wounds. Like your leader miniature has like 20 wounds in this game. Uh, treasure tokens, because you can pick up treasure, uh, and then six is special tokens that all do things. Uh, these right here, they do, a, they do a special. And then initiative token number seven, that's just whoever has the initiative for that round. So you can remember. And then fighter and ability cards. Once again, this has been spoiled already. Um, I will make some comments. That, uh, they, did very, they did a lot of pictograms here. And so here's the good thing about a pictogram as a business. You can print one set of cards and have them be in every language because a picture doesn't have to change languages. Um, and as long as that the language uses this numeric system for drawing the letter or for drawing numbers, you're going to be okay. That means that for the most commonly purchased thing, which is these character cards, you'll notice there is no English language on here. There's just numbers and symbols. They can just print these once and have them done. Um, it does mean you're gonna have to you're gonna have to memorize some symbols though, so 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 yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you figure that out. You should be fine. Now the ability cards, of course, are language language locked. Um, I showed you them earlier, uh, but your basic stuff is first you have your rune mark for your faction. So the the grilly thing is here for my Iron Man's. Um, they're iron golems. That's their symbol. It appears also on iron golems things. So if you can do something in the game, it has to be marked with your faction. These are basically keywords in 40K. So instead of having a keyword, which would have to be in a language, they have a faction symbol, which is a bit more like, it, it's drawn from Shadespire, right? That's the thing in Shadespire to having a faction symbol on your cards. You get your picture of your fighter, hooray. Uh, you get your move characteristic. That's how they can move with a move action in inches. You got your toughness characteristic. Now, interestingly enough, there's no to hit numbers in this game. There's only wound rolls. So and we'll get back to that later, but basically if you have a toughness, think of that as both how tough you are and actually the thing needed to hit you. Um, and then you have your wound characteristic, how many wounds you can take. So like this dude can take 15 wounds. That's a lot of damage. Uh, then your points value, uh, which is up here, 125 points. It's a thousand point game generally. Fighter's first weapon. So this is your, this is a, a melee weapon it looks like. Um, it's range, so its range is going to be that many inches. Um, that's its number nine. Its range character, or sorry, its attack characteristic, so it attacks with. Then its strength characteristic, so it rolls three dice to attack, and its strength four. So you would compare that to the toughness of the target. Then its damage, how much damage it does on a basic hit and a critical hit. It does two points of damage on a basic hit and four points of damage on a critical hit. So if you land all three of your attacks and they're all critical, so potentially usually all sixes, um, you do 12 points of damage to this guy which is like a huge spike of damage, but you gotta remember that even like basic dudes can take like 10, 15 points of damage. Uh, then down here, you've got a second attack, so your second weapon. This is the like semi-ranged weapon, the flaily flails. So this guy can club somebody or hit them with the flails. The flails have a three inch range. They have uh, four attack, um, four um, strength, yeah, so four attack dice on strength four, and they do one damage slash two damage on a critical hit. And then down here in the bottom, the divider cards, and this is used later on in the game. 
Uh, then general rules, rerolls, you can only roll once, roll offs, roll d6, try and reroll ties. Measuring distances, closest point to closest point any time, wholly within means every part of the person's base, visibility, true line of sight, friendly and enemy fighters, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then faction rune marks already described. And who the leader is, the leader has his own little rune mark, it's a skull and a star. Okay, so setting up a game. Uh, what's cool is, the, I do like that they did it this way. They haven't done this in previous books. They actually go through, and this is the thing I'm the biggest fan of right now in, in current miniature war games, is they write the, they, they put the game rule book together in such a way that um, you are doing things in the order you would do them in. So imagine you've just put your miniatures together and you're setting up for your first game. They give you literally doing that, putting things on the table. So put down your mat, um, select your warbands. Each warband is a, in Warcry is at least three and no more than 15 fighters. Cannot exceed a thousand points or glory or whatever. Um, and then all, more, all of them have to have the same faction rune mark. Has to have one leader with the leader rune mark. And then once you've mustered, you make the priority roll. And then you roll off to like, each of you do a d6. And then you do battle groups. Now this is interesting because you don't know what your deploy your battle plan is. You don't know what the train you're doing is, the train setup. You don't know what your deployment deck is. You don't know what your victory deck is or your twist deck, but you've already got to divide your force amongst three different things. There's the dagger, the shield, and the hammer. And those are basically the three chunks you're going to deploy them in. Everything has to have one model in it and nothing can have more than a third of your models. Um, sorry, half your models. Um, and that's going to be when you, when you flip your, after you flip your train card, your deployment deck, the deployment deck is going to say what order you deploy your things in, starting with the dagger, then with the shield, then with the hammer. And also where they can deploy. There'll be a point in the battlefield from which they can deploy. Uh, then you got reserves, reserve battle groups, or if the thing is, if the mission's using reserves, it'll explain on the card. Um, and then your victory card. Now, victory cards will give you your victory conditions for the battle plan and also um, a round length limit. Now, there are no ties in Warcry. If no one's won by the victory limit, then you play another round. And if no one's won at the end of that round, you play another round until somebody wins. There are no draws. And then finally, your twist card. It's a special twist that applies for the whole game. It can do things like bring in monsters and stuff. And then you play your game. Um, you got objectives and treasure. Uh, sometimes a victory deck will require you to place objectives. Uh, to do so, place objective marker or treasure token at the indicated location. When measuring distance, always go to the center. Controlling objectives, it's within three of the center. Um, you have more friendly fighters. And then carrying treasure, if at any point a model, uh, when making a move action, a fighter moves in the one of treasure token, they can pick it up, remove the token. The fighter is now said to be carrying the treasure. They cannot pick up a treasure if they're already carrying a treasure. So there's some run and gun loot things too. A fighter carrying a treasure can use an action to drop the treasure. And there are, this is an action game. <gasps> an action point game, I'm so excited. The battle round. So now you've got the hero phase, the reserve phase, and the combat phase. Now, this may sound familiar, but make no mistake, this is a really new game. It uses some pretty new mechanics in here. And I'm actually really jazzed about that. It's been a long time. Well, I guess since, it's not been that long a time. It's been since, I guess, the new Warhammer quest. Since Blackstone Fortress, I think. It's been a while since they did like a wholly new game. Um, Speed Freaks was kind of new, not that new, uh, but this is a really relatively new game. It uses really new mechanics, and this doesn't just steal from AOS or from 40K or from even the old Warhammer Fantasy Battle stat lines to do stuff. So Initiative Fave is actually gonna roll six dice. Now this is, this is probably things that you're gonna stumble on early on in this because it's very, it's not, in, it's not intuitive. It uses its own terminology, its own inbuilt language to explain it to you, but basically you're gonna roll six dice and you're looking for individual numbers. You're looking for, for just like the Destiny dice roll in um, Warhammer Quest, you're looking for results that aren't doubles, triples, quadruples, or quintuples, right? Now, the person that rolls the, rolls, that rolls the most single individual, like individual single numbers, that's the person that has the initiative, the priority for the turn. But it's not necessarily advantageous to do so because your abilities unlock, like the things on this card right here, unlock off of doubles, triples, and quads. So if you roll a quad on six dice, you roll four of the same number, <clears throat> it's most likely you didn't get the initiative, right? You've got two probably singles or maybe you're not if you rolled another double. Um, but you were also unlocking your biggest power. So it's a very clever mechanic because it allows you to balance um, gaining the upper hand on who goes first with unlocking really powerful things. And it's all built into a single dice roll, which I like. You also get a wild die, and this replaces command points. Your wild dice are like command points. You can choose to use them or not use them after the initiative roll. And what you do is you either use them to create another double, triple, or quad um, by setting it to a number and putting it in that pool. Or you can just save it 
If you want to just save it, you can. You can save it round to round. You get one per turn though, and once they're spent, they're gone. So just like a CP, it's allowing you to influence which of my abilities do I want to use this turn? Do I really need to get the initiative? Do I set it to a one? Now the other thing you can use it is to add a number to a single dice that the player has, um, or you can turn a single into a double, double into a triple, whatever. So if you really wanted to, um, uh, doesn't matter what the value of the wild dice was, any number can be used, and then the wild dice can be used to turn one of your singles into a double, a double into a quad, whatever. In this case, the value of the wild dice set to match the value of the singular ability or dice it's paired with. You cannot add multiple wild dice to the same single or double. Uh, each wild dice can be used once per battle. Wild dice are not used in the battle round or are saved. <clears throat> so, there's also an opportunity to seize the initiative. Once both players have declared any wild dice they will use in the battle round, count the number of singles each player has once more. If the player without the initiative now has more singles than the player with the initiative, they now have the initiative instead. If the number of singles each player has is now tied and was not previously, the player's roll off seals the initiative. So your wild dice can be used afterwards, but the player with the initiative, I think, spends them first. So you can steal the initiative potentially by using your wild dice to create a new number or create another single or whatever it is. So usually the first option is going to be used to create a single, the second option is going to be used to create a double or whatever. So you roll them in and that's really what you're doing here is you're, you're up and you're downing a die by one to try and make it a, a new single die or you're using it to create another double or triple by setting it to a number. Uh, but you can only do that if it creates a double or triple. So basically the second option can't create another initiative blip basically by rolling a single, but the first option could by uppering or downing a die by one. Uh, then the reserve phase, if it uses reserves, we'll not really look at that. And the combat phase, and the combat phase is um, where you do all your stuff. Everybody gets two actions, and there's four things you can do. You can move, you can attack, you can disengage, or you can wait. Any action can be done more than once. <laughs> so you can attack twice if you want, you can move twice, um, you can disengage and attack, you can attack and then disengage, however you want to do it, um, or you can wait. Now waiting is one of two things. You can use a wait as your second action to burn um, the rest of your activation basically and your activation or if you wait as your first action you can actually be activated again later on during the fit the turn but you only get one action when you activate so waiting is a really handy way of like let's say you have a gun you just want to sit and wait you can wait for someone to come into you and then shoot a gun at them throw a javelin huck a ninja star whatever it ends up being and of course your abilities there are universal abilities um, which anybody can use it at any time they're not faction locked one is however locked to the leader because it has a leader symbol um, and that is, <coughs> you can rush, so if you can spend any double to add one of your move characteristic, you can onslaught, add one of the attack characteristic of an attack uh, made by a fighter this activation. So it's for their activation, which means that if you spent both actions on attacking, you could do it twice. Triple, a respite. Uh, you can't use it if you're within one inch of an enemy fighter, but remove a number of damage points equal to the value of this ability. So whatever triple you rolled, that's how many damage points you rolled to take off. So if like you rolled triple sixes, that could be used at some point to heal a guy six wounds. That's huge. Um, inspiring presence, any triple, pick a fight friendly fighter that's not activated yet within six. You can activate it immediately afterwards. So you can chain activate with it. And then rampage for a quad. A fighter may uh, make a bonus move and a bonus attack action. Now bonus actions never count against your action limit. So you're basically gonna have a four action character if you use a, uh, a rampage, which is pretty awesome. And anybody can do these ones. Uh, move actions, there are four types of moves. Normal moves, move across flat terrain. Um, jumping, climbing, and flying. Fighter can use these types of move in any combination as part of a single move action, as long as the total distance in inches does not exceed the fighter's move. So, um, other rules. Fighters cannot move through other fighters, cannot move through terrain features. No fighter of a fighter can ever move over the battlefield edge if a fighter's within a bunch of the enemy. And then when they start the move action, they must finish the move action at least as close or closer to the enemy fighter. So you can move around while engaged, but you can't move further away. Uh, if there are two or more enemy fighters um, equally near, they must finish that move closer to at least, um, or close, cl as close or closer to all of them. So you can't move around if somebody's on your left. Normal moves, jumping, a fighter that's on the battlefield can jump. If they do so, the fighter can move in a straight line horizontally and any distance vertically down through the air. Count horizontal distance moved um, towards the number of inches the fighter can move is normal, but do not count the distance moved vertically downwards. However, <laughs> each time you move more than three downwards, you suffer impact damage. <laughs> impact damage. Um, where's impact damage? See opposite on the next page. Uh, impact damage is falling. Impact damage. If a fighter suffers impact damage, roll a die on a four to five allocate a point of damage. On a six, allocate three points of damage. So I mean, with 15 wounds, nah, you'd be fine. 
And it's, uh, if I didn't lose three inches or more, it's any amount, like you can jump like 24 inches and just take like a wound or three wounds, it looks like. Uh, falling, however, there's a few situations that can cause a fighter to fall. Uh, and then a fighter is said to have fallen, the opposite player picks a point in the platform or battlefield floor that's within two inches of the fighter that's fallen and is vertically lower. The fallen fighter is then placed in the center of their base on that point. Uh, if the fallen fighter is now three inches or more vertically lowered, then they suffer impact damage. So it does use set terrain, so there isn't really an opportunity to chuck somebody off a 24 inch cliff. But if you're using homemade terrain, it could enter some weird situations. Uh, climbing, if a fighter's touching a part of an obstacle, the fighter can begin to climb. If they do so, that climb can move vertically up or down. Uh, once they begin to climb, they're said to be climbing until the center of their base is on the battlefield floor or the platform. A fighter with a mount cannot climb, so no, no, mount, no climbing if you're riding an animal. And then fly, uh, count the horizontal distance moved towards the number of inches that the fighter can move. In total, in that move distance, do not count the vertical distances. Once a fighter begins to fly, they're said to be flying until the center of their base is on another platform. You cannot end your move action flying. Uh, and that's really it. So you can fly as long as it ends you somewhere uh, and you don't count any vertical distance, which is pretty cool. So you can't actually fall. You can't actually fall when you're flying either. And some examples, attack actions. Okay, so. This is where it gets very different from Kill Team. You're not rolling with a weapon skill, you're not comparing weapon skills, you're not even having a fixed weapon skill like in 40k. Um, you're just gonna pick a weapon and a target, so pick a weapon. So I'm gonna pick this guy's uh, Toothy Kilimajig. Uh, my enemy's in the one inches, so check range, I'm in range. Roll to hit. So pick up the number of dice, so in this case four, and then compare the attack value, or sorry, the strength, which is the fist here of four, to the toughness, of the target. So let's say I'm gonna hit this bird. He's toughness four. So it's four against four. Uh, if strength is greater than toughness, then you need a three to five to hit and a six is a critical. If it's equal to toughness, it's a four to five and a six. And if it's lower, it's a five or a six. So it's basically wounding in 40K, but it's just equal to is four plus, higher is three plus, lower is five plus. And you're always gonna crit on a six. And that's it. It's a really simple to hit mechanic. There's not, there's not like, there's not a lot to learn there. It's pretty intuitive. Um, when you allocate damage, the uh, damage allocated to each of these weapons has two values. The first one is a basic hit, the other one's a critical. Um, for each hit, allocate a number of damage points equal to the first value of the target. And then remove down and taking down fighters. So damage points are allocated one at a time. If the number of damage points allocated to a fighter equals its wound characteristic, um, the fighter is said to be taken down. Place a de taken down fighter token on its side. They are removed from the battlefield. A taken down fighter takes no further part in the battle. They cannot be activated, cannot make actions, cannot use abilities. When a fighter is taken down, any leftover damage from the attack is discarded. And that's it. There's no like having to make an injury roll. There's no like bonus armor saves. You just pile up wounds until you're dead, basically. Hitting against strength and toughness. There's that. Uh, disengage actions. So a disengage action isn't a move. It's an action you can take if you're within one inch of the enemy. You can move three inches in any direction, but you have to finish more than one from the enemy. So it's basically a pile out move. And then you can still take a second action anyway. Um, if it's impossible, the fighter cannot use a disengage action unless you use another action instead. So you, if you can't get away from a one inch, then you're not allowed to disengage. You gotta kill everybody you're fighting first. And then await, as I described, if you use it, your second action as your activation, as your first action, you can be activated again. You place a weight token next to them, but you only get a single action during that activation, which is pretty cool. Um, if a fighter, and then weight actions and abilities, if a fighter activates for a second time in the combat phase as a result of a weight action, they can use one ability in their second activation, even if it was used the first time they activated. In addition, when activating the second time, uh, that one ability can be used by the fighter either before their action or after their action. When a rule or ability refers to this fighter's activation, it means that the fighter's current activation. Uh, and then terrain, uh, cover. Uh, you get plus one toughness if you're within a half inch of an obstacle once between you and the enemy. Hooray! <laughs> you can fall off terrain when attack um, action targets enemy fighter within half inch of the edge of a platform and scores any criticals. The target of the fighter uh, of, the, of that attack must take a falling test to avoid falling. To do so, the player controlling the fighter rolls a die on a one. They're said to have fallen, and you can't fall if you fly. I think that's funny. So, like, you can get knocked off edges like an old Necromunda. Uh, rules for deadly terrain, stairs and ladders, archways and doors, and then chaotic beasts. Now, the way the chaotic beasts activate, they come in as twists typically, unless they're part of your warband. If they're part of warband, they just activate normally. If they're part of um, the twist of the scenario you're playing, every time you have the opportunity to activate a model, you can say, I'm going to activate a chaotic beast instead. However, you roll a die on a 3 plus, activate them as normal. They can use these chaotic beast abilities in addition to other abilities, the basic ones. 
Um, but on a one or a two, your opponent gets to activate them instead, and it still counts as your activation. So there is a risk. There is no rerolling dice mechanic in this. On a one or two, you've just given away your activation, and your opponent gets to choose what the beast does. So there's a risk. And then thralls, um, in certain battles a player may be able to include special fighters called thralls, is usually in a campaign game because of the result of a campaign game. Um, if a player is allowed to include any thralls in their warband, they can choose any fighters of the Chaotic Beast faction rune mark that has the thrall rune mark. So like Mr. Dilophosaurus bird here has that rune mark right there. You can see there's that little like chainy collary thing. Um, and they become part of your warband while they're a thrall. And they're not subject to all the, the stupid things. Here's all the rune marks in the game. Hooray! And then open play. So doing open play, it's basically just like a scenario generator. It's a it's it's actually more like a 40k scenario, <laughs> an open play 40k scenario, than anything else. And it's for different deployment styles. Uh, you can see here here's some examples of the symbols for deployment. So for instance, um, for battle lines, your uh, dagger deploys in reserve and can come in on round two. Your shield deploys in this band, uh, basically of the table, and then your hammer deploys back there during deployment. Uh, victory, random victory conditions for open play, and then Triumph and Treachery, which is open play multiplayer games, which is super fun, again, with like random results and stuff. And we won't talk too much about that. Now, narrative play. Narrative play is your entire campaign section. All right, this is what we've been waiting for. Is this new Mordheim? Of course it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's got about three pages of campaign rules. And the campaign is actually just playing a linked series of battle plans that are all prescribed by whatever faction you pick. Um, you play through a number of games, you always scratch off a game on the campaign list until you get to a convergence. And at the convergence point, you have to win the game to continue. But when you get to a conversion point, you get to roll for artifacts and cool things that the campaign can like provide to you. Um, so after that, you get, in the next game you get an artifact. So typically what happens is you play a game, you play a game, you play a convergence game, you have to win. Then you get an artifact of power if you win this game, play a game, play a game. Second convergence point, you have to win. Then you get to get a command trait if you win your next game. Or actually just for playing the next game. Play a game, play a game, final convergence. And then you get your campaign goal, which is usually an artifact that you can take. Once you've played that, you can go ahead and play another campaign if you want, if you have one. The other non Warcry campaign or um, armies in here only have a single campaign. Or, a, yeah, they only have an actual campaign with one artifact. So they'll have to wait for more to come out. Maybe their faction decks will give them that. Maybe it'll be in White Dwarf. Who knows? Maybe it'll be in the next supplement for this game. I, I don't really know. Uh, there are minor and major artifacts, and when you build a, a roster, the, the one thing I do like, they did change from Kill Team in this, you build a 20 model roster, no more, no less. It has to have at least three models, no more than 20, and that's all you get to pick from. <laughs> so there isn't the unlimited hire a new specialist, whatever. It's you get to pick from that those 20 guys for the course of the campaign. Um, when you actually play, uh, you make injury rolls and you can die. It's a 2d6 roll. You can uh, be slain on a 2 to 3. 4 to 5, you lose any of the favor you got, so you lose a destiny level. Um, and on a 6 plus, you get a full recovery. So first you earn and spend glory points. You can spend glory points on all kinds of things. They can be spent on the table below. So you can, you earn them for playing a game. Your leader uh, took some of the warbands out. Uh, at least one third of the enemy's opponent's fighters were taken down for a glory point. At least two thirds for a glory point. All the fighters were taken out for another glory point. And if you win the game, you get five. So take part and win, you get six glory points. If your leader killed some, if the leader of your opponent's warband was taken down, you get seven. Um, and then you can spend glory on different ways. So you can dominate an area of territory. Each campaign quest has its own territory rule, which explains how to dominate it. For example, you must be raising monoliths on glory points or whatever. Uh, and then on reinforcements, you can choose them on reinforcements. To do so, they can spend either one glory point or three glory points. If they spend one, they increase the number of points they have available to spend on fighters by 50. If they spend three, it's by 100. A player can't spend more than three glory points in this manner before a campaign battle. So. They go away though. You can basically buy extra troops, like an extra guy almost, by spending glory. But once you spend the glory, it's gone. So your warband can get a little over a thousand. If you spend, you can get a hundred extra points, you'd be at 1100. Um, and you can use a dominate territory too. And dominate territory in a mission gives you additional stuff. And then finally, you can spend on extra search rolls. Um, you spend three extra glory points to roll again on the search table for lesser artifacts. 
But less artifacts don't last. Most are consumable. Some are perishable, which means at the end of each game, you're all die on a one to three, they survive to the next game on a four plus, or sorry, on four plus, they survive on a one to three, they go away. And then finally, you can roll for destiny levels. This is the only improvement that fighters get. Uh, at the end of each game, if you survive and want to take it out of action, you roll die on a six, you earn a destiny level. Remember, you can lose destiny levels too if you roll a four or five an injury chart later on or a little knocked out. Every destiny level you have, up to a maximum of three, is just a reroll you can use during the game. So you can reroll die once per game, your destinies come back. So the, the highest level guy in a campaign with three destiny levels might have an artifact or something like that, could reroll three dice over the course of the game and has like a cool extra ability from his artifact. Uh, then you can add and remove fighters, uh, search for lesser artifacts. You get one search automatically after each game, but you can buy more for three glory. Uh, and then, yeah, you assign people that you, you can't take them off people once they have them, but most of the time they go away once they're used anyway, um, or can potentially be perishable. And that's really it. That's your campaign rules. Here's all your lesser artifacts. Uh, on a one to uh, one, you basically find nothing. It's a D66 table. Heal pots, swift wind dust, you can do no impact damage, skin of flame ale, jar of commodic glow flies, bobble of shadows. There's uh, two, four, six, eight, nine. Uh, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 artifacts. Um, of those, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 or once per game, 8 are perishable, where they might go in on 1 to 4, or 1 to 3. That's cool. I mean, it's cool. It's, it's 18 things you can, 18 little MacGuffins you can get to go with your extra rolls you earn from your experience. Uh, then you advance on the campaign progress tracker, so you get to scratch off a thing if you if you won your. It doesn't even matter if you win your game. Only on the convergences do you have to win the game. You earn an artifact of power and command traits. So if you get to these games and finish the game, you earn an artifact of power and command trait. Again, they're in your quest. They're all defined by your quest. Uh, and then favored warriors. If your warband receives a command trait, but your leader already has one, so like you've already gone through a quest, you're doing a second quest. You can nominate a um, favored warrior. They can get a command trait instead, and you only get one favored warrior. Uh, and that's it, completing a command quest and then choose a new command campaign quest. So uh, you can either choose a new campaign quest with a faction room mark that matches the one on your warband roster, note down the new campaign quest on your warband roster, or remove all dominant territories and glory from your roster and move your warband back to start. And that's it. So you keep all your guys and they keep all their levels and stuff like that. Um, but so like this part would say the same, you erase all this, all this, and just start a new one. And that's it. And you lose all your glory points that you had as well. So. You can, you can play through all the campaigns. You get three campaigns to play through per warband, basically, um, in this book. And then match play. And there are straight up rules. There's 12 scenarios, 12 battle plans. There's straight up rules for tournaments in here, um, for playing in tournaments. It is a thousand thing muster. Um, you do like a pitched battle, basically. <laughs> and it's all preset battle plans to challenge people. I think this is gonna be popular. It's a popular Adepticon with Kill Team. Uh, I think this will be popular for this as well. And then how to score the tournaments. Um, you also get a resurrection tournament Blood Bowl style thing where at the start of each battle after the first, the players roll off. Um, starting with the player who won the roll off, each player picks one fighter to gain a destiny level and then roll for a lesser artifact on this table. Oh, sorry, on the lesser artifact table. Um, Destiny levels are gained uh, and in effect for the rest of the tournament. So just like skill advances were given out sometimes in resurrection tournaments in Blood Bowl, because you don't earn experience in tracking and stuff, you just give a guy a skill after the second game and the third game. It's the same in this. <clears throat> and then these are campaigns. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can see here, uh, Conquer the Forge is a campaign. Here's the missions for the three convergences. You get artifacts of power, you get campaign rules. You get Cursed Metals, here's your second campaign for the Iron, uh, Ironborn, Iron, Iron Sworn, whatever. Uh, artifacts, Command Traits, three campaigns for your Convergences, and then, oh sorry, actually, sorry, it's only two per Warband. That's right, it's one for the non-special factions, two for the other ones. Um, and yeah, you get your Artifacts, you get your Convergences, Tooth and Claw, or the Tower, oh, no wait, you get, yeah, you get two for this one. Uh, two for these guys, the Birdmans. And then two for the eye people. <laughs> Can't remember their names, I'm sorry. Uh, Song of Suffering, the Serpent Mans, Thalsa Doom's Army, Venom of the Gods, the Tide of Fire from the Fire Folks. Uh, and then here we go, we're into the non-faction ones now. So um, here we have, I think this is the Undead. I can't, it's funny because they don't put the name anywhere. So I think this is supposed to be Nagash's. Yeah, this is Legion of Nagash. This is um, the Stormcast. Uh, or is this Legion of the Ash? Maybe the Legion of Sacrament? No, maybe this is Legion of the Ash, they want some other undead thing. 
Uh, you get your gets. You got your Ida Deepkin. You got your vampire counts. I don't even know anymore. Night haunts. <laughs> you got your Iron Skulls, your Bjork Mans. Uh, and this one is the Marathi Ladies. And then your Bone Splitters. And that's it. So now don't, I'm, I'm gonna flip right past this, the Spells of Victory part, because these are all your, your, your I completed the quest special things that you get. Uh, and we don't wanna look at that because those are supposed to be saved for the end. This would be like flipping to paragraph 400 in a fighting fantasy book. And then you get your background tables. So you get your crazy, your special names. Now what's funny, you don't get any D10s in this box, but they copied the D10 table. I thought they'd give you at least one D10. I went looking for it when I saw these were in here. They don't. There's no D10s. Um, but you can D10 for names and then D6 for your origin and your background. Uh, you get them for the beast, the Corvus Cabots at Cypher Lords, the Unmade. I love the Unmade. They're so cool. Splinter Fang, Signs of the Flame, Spire Tyrants, Night Haunts. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's rounds of the flame. I guess I'm wrong. I guess the, they're, I guess actually not the, the blood man. I thought they were. Uh, and then your spot tyrants, your night haunts, stormcast turtles, legions of the ash, gloom spike gets, ident deepkin, flush of your quartz, and iron jaws, and then your daughters of cane, your bone splitters. So they all do get their backgroundy stuff in here, and then all your cards and battle plan generators, and that's it. That is the book. Uh, you get some photocopyable uh, roster sheets and a tournament roster sheet too, which is nice. And so there it is, uh, Warhammer Age of Sigmar Warcry, a first look and a review of the contents of the box. Now, I think we're probably going to use, we're going to play some games over the course of the weekend, and on Sunday, for my Let's Talk, you'll be able to hear me and Owen sit down and chat about what we thought, what our impressions of Warcry are. Um, I'm not surprised by the campaign rules. I didn't think we'd get more than we got in Kill Team, and we got actually significantly more in a way, because there's actually some story-driven campaign narrative stuff, so I'm actually really pleased with that. Is the, is the crunch there special equipping guys? No, it's not Necromunda. Um, you can't like buy special guns or change up your models. Uh, but there's enough that I think it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun to tell stories. This is very much in fitting with the, the narrative play mode in Age of Sigmar itself. I think that's gonna be fun. The match play looks neat. Uh, I'm not keen on this. I wish there was a compendium of knowing what everything does because I can't even look at what a faction does except for I guess going on like the community page and seeing spoilers before I buy them. I wish there was more in the book. Like honestly with seven or eight cards, it would just take a page. Just literally lay out these cards on one page and you could have had all the factions um, available for perusal. And will it show up online? Of course it'll show up online. There's, it's, um, it's the internet. <laughs> like people are gonna be talking about it and you'll see it other places, but for the longevity of the game, being able to, and it's funny because I've been doing these throwback Thursdays and these rule book reviews and stuff, being able to just find a rule book somewhere at some point in a game store and open it up and then go and buy the box toy soldiers associated with it, or make your own box toy soldiers that you like, like convert models to play the game with, is important. And this rule book is very much a rules manual. It's got a wonderfully detailed story campaign in it, but then it doesn't have any rules for the actual toy soldiers. And the Kill Team rule book did do that, and it did it really well. Um, this rule book is is more purely rules for playing the game uh, and requires an associated thing. And, and they did do it, I don't get why, they did do it for all the other cards. They did it for these cards here, but they didn't do it for the cards for the actual stats for the guys. And I wish they had. Um, that's my one little, my one little wish so far. So I'm excited to try it out. I am excited to try it out. I think we're gonna play through, I, what, I, what my plan is for this is we're gonna play through a campaign and get out of our systems. And next week is gonna be Warcry week. And I think what I'm gonna do is, for people who like other games, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a GMG review every day of the week next week, Monday through Friday, for other game systems. And we're just gonna play Warcry. So starting on Saturday, you're gonna see the first Warcry game. We'll, we'll do the Let's Play. And then we're just gonna play through the campaign. And how many games is the campaign again? And we'll just play through until it's done. So if I start on, is it nine games? Oh my God, where's the roster? Ash, you're terrible at this. You're the worst reviewer ever. Uh, it's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 games actually. So we won't be able to do it between Saturday and Saturday or Saturday and Friday next week. We'll be able to get Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We'll be able to get seven games done. Six games. Yeah, you know what? Six games done. We'll do six games. We'll get halfway through a campaign and we'll give you our impressions how we feel and maybe we'll come back and we'll, we'll finish the rest of the campaign slowly over the course of the weeks. But like, I want to get work out of my system because there's so many games to cover this summer. There's so much stuff coming out, but I'm very excited for work I do want to give it a, like a good college try. Um, and I feel like I need to play at least a couple games before we, and you'll, you'll watch them as we go, before we give our opinion of it. Um, cause yeah, cause the narrative part seems fun but it feels just from reading the book so far more like buying 
a campaign module for World of Warcraft. I guess. Actually, even less than that. For buying, like, if, you're, if there was, like, a story mode for League of Legends, because you can't really change these guys, right? You're picking your characters, and then you're playing through a story. Um, I don't know what you would call that. I don't even know what a good current game analog is for that, because my video game knowledge is, is, is far out of date. <laughs> but I think you guys get where I'm coming from. Where you're playing through a Link series of stories, that's cool, but you're, you're swapping in and out characters. They are gaining some story and stuff, but it's your imagination doing the enhancements to the characters and what they're doing. There isn't like a crunchy mechanic in the game for actually like leveling guys. This isn't Dark Souls. You're not leveling guys up and making them cool um, through those kinds of additional mechanics. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. Um, this first look at Warcry, Age of Sigmar. Um, and of course, tune in Saturday for the Let's Play. Uh, as Owen and I start ripping this thing uh, apart, painting it, getting it all put together, and you'll get to see us bleary-eyed Saturday morning. So <laughs> thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thunder Mash. No, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Ray Designs, um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.